ಓಕೆ ಇಸ್ ಇಟ್ ವರ್ಕ್ ಎಸ್ ಓಕೆ ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ಐ ಲೈಕ್ ಟು ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ದಿ ಆರ್ಗನೈಸರ್ಸ್ ಫಾರ್ ದಿ ಆಪರ್ಚುನಿಟಿ ಟು ಸ್ಪೀಕ್ ಹಿಯರ್ ಓ ಐ ಬಟ್ ಐ ಐ ಆಲ್ಸೋ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಟು ಕಂಪ್ಲೇನ್ ಬಿಕಾಸ್ ದೇ ಆರ್ ಸ್ಪಾಯ್ಲಿಂಗ್ ಮೀ ವಿತ್ ಲಕ್ಸರಿ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಆಫ್ಟರ್ ಲಿವಿಂಗ್ ಒನ್ ವೀಕ್ ಇನ್ ಸಚ್ ಅ ನೈಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಟೆಲ್ ಐ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಬಿ ವೆರಿ ಡಿಫಿಕಲ್ಟ್ ಟು ಗೋ ಬ್ಯಾಕ್ ಟು ಮೈ ಹಂಬಲ್ ಅಪಾರ್ಟ್ಮೆಂಟ್ anyway so the the goal of my talk was is going to be to give you an overview of uh, melin amplitudes so this my work in this uh, topic has been done with several people so i i would just like to highlight my younger collaborators vasco gonçalves and emilio trevisani who did great work in this uh, last paper on factorization of melin amplitudes from last year okay so my talk will be divided into two main parts so in the first part i'll just introduce melin amplitudes and explain their main properties um, in conformal field theory in general and then in the second part i'll discuss specific properties that arise in holographic conformal field theory so so before we start with the equations let me just uh, explain the basic philosophy behind this story So the idea is that we would like to study scattering processes in ADS but we cannot just use uh, the standard scattering amplitude because ADS acts like a box so there's no scattering states so the idea is that we can do something similar which is to send in some excitations from the boundary let them scatter in ADS and then detect them at the boundary at some later time okay so in practice this just means we are computing boundary we are computing correlation functions of the boundary cft okay so so that's the the idea that you should think of correlation functions of the dual cft as ads scattering amplitudes but in position space this looks very different look like very different objects okay so the idea and that's what i want to convince you is that if you write this correlation functions in melin space then this analogy becomes very uh, transparent okay and moreover then you can use this analogy to guide your search and to learn more about conformal field theory okay so let's start uh, in conformal field theory so i'll just uh, uh, define uh, what the melin amplitude is so let's consider a correlation function of n scalar uh, primary operators and uh, this is the basic equation so you just have some integral transform where the distances between all the points appear here and you just integrate over these melin variables gamma ij which are just this exponent okay so this was introduced by mac in 2009 so the melin amplitude is then just this function here so, okay there's some gamma functions that we introduced for convenience and this is the definition of the melin amplitude. So I should say that so conformal symmetry imposes some constraints on these uh, variables so it's very easy to see that basically the constraints are given here so it's convenient to think of these gamma ij variables as a symmetric matrix whose diagonal elements are just given by the dimension of the scalar operators okay this is just a, a convention it doesn't appear in the formula but if you define it like that then the constraints of conformal symmetry are just that the sum over one index of this matrix has to be zero okay and so if you satisfy these constraints automatically for any choice of m this function will have the right uh, conformal transformation properties of a correlation function once you impose these constraints then you can count the number of integration variables that you have and that matches precisely the number of cross ratios okay so you just have n n minus 1 over 2 of diagonal elements minus n constraints so you have the standard number of cross ratios okay so to to see this more explicitly let me just do the specific case of a four point function okay so i just in this case i just consider the four point function of equal operators or operators with equal dimension and i just solve explicitly the constraints 
keeping gamma 1, 2, and gamma 1, 4 as the independent variables. Okay? So if you do that, the expression organizes exactly as you expect. So you get some prefactor that fixes the scaling, and then you have some transform that only involves the two cross ratios of your four point function. Okay? So it's really just a Mellin transform with respect to the cross ratio. So this example is good because it helped me to explain uh, in detail the integration contour that you should uh, use in this uh, representation. So from these gamma functions that I introduced here, you see that they have poles at the negative integers, or this one has poles at delta equals gamma 1, 2 equals delta minus gamma 1, 4 plus integers. Okay? So the gamma functions will give you semi-infinite sequence of poles, one in each direction. And the prescription is that the integration contour should run parallel to the imaginary axis, but splitting these two uh, semi-infinite sequences. So I, I'm not uh, plotting them here, but the Mellin amplitude, we shall see it also has poles that come in semi-infinite sequences. Okay? So it's also uh, the same prescription applies. You will have poles associated with the Mellin amplitude, and they, again, you choose the contour such that they all lie on one side. OK, so from this, you already he see some hint of uh, similarity with scattering amplitude. So for example, if you think of this function as a function of three variables with one constraint, this is then permutation symmetry of the original uh, correlation function just corresponds to permuting these three variables. Okay? So this is analogous to writing a scattering amplitude as a function of Mendelssohn invariance S, T, and U, and then you have a constraint and permutation from crossing symmetry. OK, but uh, the most important property of the Mellin amplitude actually follows from the operator product expansion. So let's, let me just consider the simplest case. So let's take two scalar operators in the limit where they are close together. And the OPE tells you that the singularity structure is just power-like. And the powers that appear are just controlled by the dimensions of the operators that appear in this OPE. Okay? But now you should, this is an operator equation, so it's valid inside correlation functions. So you should compare this with the Mellin representation of a correlation function involving these operators. So in this limit, x1, 2 goes to 0, the only um, non-trivial dependence on x12 is just this power in gamma12. Okay? So you see, in order to reproduce this simple power-like behavior, you just have to have simple poles precisely at positions fixed by the dimension of these operators that appear in the OPE. Moreover, if you do this carefully, you see that the descendants, they have dimensions that differ by integers, so actually you get these semi-infinite sequences of poles that I was mentioning before. In addition, the, the residue, it's also clear that the residue will be related to the OP coefficient times the lower point Mellin amplitude. Okay? So, so in fact, this is a very general result, which uh, tells you that the Mellin amplitude is a very nice and simple analytic structure. Okay? So they are analytic functions, and they only have simple poles. And the simple poles are really associated with physical uh, operators that appear in the OPE and controlled by their dimensions and their OPE coefficient. OK, so let me now try to explain the more general result that the OPE implies for endpoint functions. Okay? So to do that, it's very convenient to introduce some fictitious momenta, some momenta pi, such that the inner product of these vectors is equal to this Mellin variable. Okay, so in particular, they satisfy some on shell condition. And I will also impose that they uh, are conserved, so the total momenta sums to 0. And that condition actually is very nice, because from this, it follows that the gamma ij's solve these constraints that we had before. That if you sum over one index, it vanishes. Okay? So it's, it's very important that you do not confuse this as this is not real momenta. It's not like what you get by Fourier transform of the correlation function from position space to momentum space. Okay? This is morally like momenta. You will see why I say that. But it's not, it's not just a Fourier transform. So why is this useful? 
Well, this is very useful because if you do this trick, then you basically, your natural guess for the position of the poles gets immediately realized. So let me just explain that in the simplest example. So suppose you have an endpoint function of scalars. So you have an endpoint Mellin amplitude. And so you have momenta associated with each one of these legs. And so suppose now that, so for each operator in your theory, you will have poles whenever the, some partial sum of the momenta goes on shell, where by on shell, I mean this condition here. Okay. So you have, and moreover, the residue of this on shell pool is just a product of the lower point Mellin amplitude. Okay. So this, well, I hope you see that it's really the precise analog of what happens in scattering amplitude. So this is the, the simplest uh, case. So let me just uh, state the more general result. So let me still consider an endpoint function of scalars. But now, suppose you also have uh, operators which have non-zero spin. Then actually, you will have a pole in this more general on-shell condition. So it's actually the twist of the operator that controls the position of the pole, dimension minus spin. And again, you have these semi-infinite sequences of poles. So for, for each operator, you don't have one pole. You have an infinite sequence of poles. But again, the residues are completely determined by the lower point Mellin amplitudes. So OK, the formulas become a bit more complicated if you increase the spin or if you increase this index m. But the statement that they are completely determined by the lower point Mellin amplitudes, it's still true. So for example, uh, if you go to the simplest case of the four-point function, then basically the residue is just a product of the two OP coefficients times some specific kinematical polynomial um, whose degree is fixed by the spin of the accent operator. Okay? So again, in very close analogy with flat space scattering amplitude. OK, so the last thing I want to say about generic uh, CFTs is um, about CFTs before moving to ADS CFT is about uh, a CFT when you have a large N expansion. So, so in this case, there are some operators, namely double trace operators, which you already know their dimension uh, up to 1 over N square correction. Right? Their dimension is just the sum of the building blocks, so the single trace constituents of the double trace operator. So in particular, we know some poles, we expect some poles in the Mellin integral. But remarkably, what happens is that actually these gamma functions that were just introduced uh, in the definition have exactly poles at this location. Okay? So from here, actually, what follows is that the Mellin amplitude cannot have poles associated with double trace operators because these poles are already taken into account by the gamma function. So what this implies is that when you consider a planar correlation function in a large NCFT, actually the, the structure of the Mellin amplitude is much simpler than the original correlation function, because most of the complexity of the OPE was involved in multi-trace operators, and that does not contribute any poles to the Mellin amplitude. OK. So let me now move on to uh, ADS-CFT. So, so in this case, um, the first thing that uh, one can do is to look at examples. So let's compute some Mellin amplitudes associated with uh, uh, correlation functions that you obtain by computing Witten diagrams in ADS. And the simplest Witten diagram you can do is just a contact interaction. So what happens in this case is just the Mellin amplitude is just a constant. Okay. So it's, it's basically the, this integral in ABS just produces it's equal to the integral, to the Mellin integral with the Mellin amplitude given by a constant. So you can complicate this a bit. So you can decorate this contact interaction by putting derivatives. So imagine these indices of derivatives are contracted in some way between the, this uh, acting on the several fields. So and what you obtain here is that the Mellin amplitude is just a polynomial in the Mellin variables, whose degree is actually related to the number of derivatives that you put uh, in your interaction vertex. Okay, so 
Again, what you see is that actually these two statements are just exactly true if you compute the scattering amplitude in flat space using these vertices. Okay. So next thing you can compute is some uh, exchange diagrams. So, so here, so in, in these two papers, we were able to find uh, Feynman rules for scalar exchange diagrams in AVS. And uh, so here, I'm just drawing one example to give you an idea of how simple, how similar these Feynman rules are to flat space Feynman rules. So let's just to consider this kind of five-point function where you have two bulk-to-bulk -bulk, bulk -bulk propagators associated with some dimension delta and some dimension delta bar. So, so how to compute the Mellin amplitude associated with this, uh, with this diagram? Well, the, the first thing to do is to introduce these momenta that uh, seem to be so useful in telling you where are the poles. So you introduce this momenta P1 up to P5, and you impose momentum conservation at the bulk vertices. Okay? So you associate to each leg a given momenta. Once you do that, you just do Feynman rules. So I'll just write here the answer. So you have three bulk vertices. So you have three factors for the vertices, which are just some constants independent of the mandal of the Mellin variables. And then you have two bulk-to-bulk -bulk propagators. So you have two, sorry, you have two propagator factors, one here and one here. And the propagator factors are just precisely the kind of denominators you should expect. So they just give you poles. Uh, in the positions predicted by the OPE, and they have some numerator, which is some number that you can compute. Okay? So, and again, you have to sum over these integers m and m bar, so there's an integer associated to each internal propagator. So there's no factor associated with the bulk to boundary propagator, so it's like an amputated amplitude. And the entire dependence on the Mellin variables is just this explicit dependence, so when you expand this square, this, it only comes from the propagators. Okay? So again, it's well, very similar to scattering amplitude. So, so this, this very strong similarity to scattering amplitudes can be, made, um, can be made very precise in the sense that you can actually uh, establish a very precise relation between a Mellin amplitude that you obtain from some diagram that you compute in anti sitter space to a scattering amplitude that you obtain by computing the same diagram in flat space, um, basically just by changing the external legs instead of putting bulk to boundary propagators, you just put plane waves like you usually do in scattering amplitude. Okay? So here, uh, if you take the limit keeping the external dimensions fixed, then, of course, when you take this large radius limit to go from anti sitter space to flat space, uh, the, the mass in, in flat space goes to zero. Okay? So, so the, the formula I'm going to show you will relate the Mellin amplitude associated with this diagram to the scattering amplitude of massless particles in flat space. Time, okay? And so the formula is, is just like that. So Basically, you just have to compute the Mellin amplitude and then evaluate it, replacing the Mellin variables by the inner product of the actual momentum in flat space times the radius of ADS. Right? So you take the radius of ADS to infinity, so you're taking the large, uh, the limit of large gamma ij in the Mellin amplitude. Okay? And, uh, and there's some integral over one single variable integral that you, that you have to do. And after taking this limit, you recover the scattering amplitude. Okay. So let me just make a few comments about this formula. So, so this formula you can check in very examples. You can check in infinite classes of examples by taking these contact interactions with arbitrary number of derivatives. And actually, it was also derived by Fitzpatrick and Kaplan using a wave packet construction. So you, you basically prepare wave packets that scatter in a very small region of ADS, much smaller than the radius of ADS, so it's literally probing flat space scattering. And by doing this wave packet construction, you, you also arrive at this formula. So, 
So that's why we, that's the evidence we have for this formula. So in principle, this formula can give you a non-perturbative definition of a scattering amplitude in, in flat space, right? So if you, if you take uh, the, suppose you have infinite computational power to compute a four-point function in n equals four supering mills, you compute this Mellin amplitude, you take this limit, you get a string scattering um, in, uh, in type 2B string theory in flat space. Okay? Actually, in practice, it's more the other way around that it works because we know much more about uh, string theory in flat space than strongly coupled uh, n equals 4 to bring mills. So this formula can actually be used to obtain the strong coupling expansion of the four-point function uh, in n equals four superring mill. Yeah, that, that was actually worked out by Vasco Gonçalves uh, last year. Okay, so I should, now I want to, to give you some comments about this um, emergence of both locality from uh, uh, the conformal field theory, okay? So, so here I wanna take this uh, standard approach that I wanna say, suppose you have a conformal field theory with a large n expansion and with a large gap in the spectrum of anomalous dimensions, okay? So let's suppose that I only have a finite number of low dimension uh, primary operators. So from what I said so far, now if you consider a four point function in this theory, in the, in the planar limit, uh, clearly the Mellin amplitude associated with this four point function can only have a finite number of uh, sequences of poles associated with the single trace operators, okay? But these are very easy to construct, okay? This you just write some finite number of exchange diagrams in ADS, which will give you precisely these sequences of poles, okay? But of course, to this, you can add any contact diagram in ADS because you can add any polynomial, at least crossing symmetric polynomial uh, of the Mellin variables to the Mellin amplitude, okay? So, the statement is just from the analytic structure of the Mellin amplitudes, if you impose large n and a large gap, you conclude that the four point function in this CFT must be given by a sum of a finite sum of exchange diagrams in AVS plus some contact diagrams in AVS. Okay? But these contact diagrams can, in principle, have an arbitrary number of derivatives. Okay? So so you derive a, a weak form of locality. You can write some local interactions, but you don't have any obvious way of bounding the number of derivatives, okay? But actually, now we can do a bit better. So if you, there's another thing that I didn't have time to explain, which is you can look at the regi limit of these four-point functions, and in particular, the regi limit in Mellin space. And that's just corresponding to taking um, uh, actually, I'm sorry. Sorry, I, I didn't define, I think I changed some slides. So S and T are just two of the Mellin variables. Think of it as gamma 1, 2 and gamma 1, 4, for example. So the regi limit is just defined by taking one of the Mellin variables to be very large and the other one to be fixed, okay? And in fact, you can study this limit and uh, you conclude that so actually, let, let me be more precise. So we studied this limit using a generalization of the regi theory techniques to conformal field theory. And we find that the behavior of the Mellin amplitude in this limit is power-like. It goes like S to some power, which is called the intercept, which is related to some analytic continuation of the dimensions, but it's not important from here. It's for some power law behavior. But actually, in our study, this there was several non-trivial assumptions about the analytic continuation of dimensions and OP coefficients as a function of the spin, okay? But more recently, in this, in this paper, which I think is the topic of the next talk, so you will understand it very well, they were able to prove that this indeed is the behavior and actually this J0, this maximal, this exponent, this intercept, cannot be bigger than two. And it's only two in, in gravity when it's the fastest possible growth, okay? But now you see, once you have that, it's really a much stronger sense of, uh, of locality. 
because now all these higher derivative polynomials will give you polynomials that grow much faster than s squared. Okay? So, so you just drop it completely, and now you can basically say that uh, uh, large n plus large gap really implies on the CFT side a very strong, the strong sense of locality, that every four-point function is described by local interaction in AVS with a finite number of derivatives. Okay? So you should think of this as the generalization to the four-point function of these causality constraints on the possible structures in the three-point function um, of the stress energy tensor. And I should conclude. So basically, I will, I will not go through this list. You can ask me if you want. So I'll leave you with this list of problems for the future. Thank you very much. I have a question. Actually, two. Uh, so, in the large n limit for n equal four, you have a large number of uh, finite dimensional readers. Yeah, sorry. Uh, for n equal four, for instance, in large n, you have a large number of finite dimensional readers. Good. You say because you get a higher dimensional uh, supergravity theory. Uh, n equal four for large n as an in right. infinite number of uh, low but dimensional. I mean. Uh, but you're saying large n and, and strong coupling. Yeah. So you, you mean large number because you have all these big towers of BPS operators? Yes. OK, so that's, yeah, here I made the argument with a finite number, but that's because I'm trying to derive a local theory just in AVS. Okay? In n equals 4, you don't get a local theory just in AVS. You get a no local theory in AVS 5 cross S5. So, so these infinite numbers are, are just the Kaluza Klein modes on S5. I have a second question, may I ask? So uh, in the original, uh, um, at the beginning, you were re replacing uh, this gamma ij with uh, uh, products of uh, momenta in arbitrary dimension to start with. Uh, so uh, eventually, you ended up with uh, the flat limit of ADS. Good. That's a very good question. So I didn't define the space where these fictitious momenta live. And uh, the honest answer is, I don't know. Of course, if you go through this argument, then given the relation to the flat space limit and how similar Mellin amplitudes are to scattering amplitudes in AVS, it's suggestive that they should live in d plus one dimensions. But uh, basically, I told you everything I know about this momenta, so there's no intrinsic definition. Okay. Just to go back to that flat space limit, this is probably well known to all the experts, but is the physical picture behind why you can relate the flat space amplitude that you kind of do the scattering in ADS space very close to the Poincare horizon where things are very uh, uh, boosted, highly boosted, and then it doesn't matter that you have the curvature of ADS? Is that? So, is, I mean, is that from the physical point of view, probably the best answer is this uh, wave packet construction. So you. Usually, when you compute the Witten diagram, you put as external wave functions the bolt to boundary propagators. Mm -hmm. But if you, if you instead of like, that corresponds to putting the operator at a precise point. Mm -hmm. Now, if you integrate this position, you can actually prepare a wave packet which just moves, I mean, it has a finite transverse spread. Mm -hmm. And so you can really prepare wave packets that only scatter in a small region of ADS, much okay. smaller than the radius of ADS. Okay. So the scattering is really a, a local scattering. Okay. Well, another way of saying is that we, we use scattering amplitudes in, in the LHC. Right, right. We don't care about the curvature of, of right. the universe. Okay. So it's, it's more or less the same thing. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>